Welcome to EB-5 Investment Voice, where attorney insights intersects with immigration investments. If you are a foreign investor, domestic fund manager, or enterprising entrepreneur and want to get the most out of the EB-5 program, you have come to the right place. I'm Mark Deal, and I'll be your co-host on this journey. I'm joined by your host, Mona Shaw, and other attorneys at Mona Shaw & Associates, as well as immigration leaders from around the world. So let's get into EB-5 Investment Voice. Mona, Happy New Year. Happy 2022. Are we already at 2022, Mark? <laughs> what, what happened to 2021? <laughs> uh, time flies by. Yeah. In yeah. this pandemic world, it seems uh, it seems like every day is a century, but every year is a day. I don't know how that makes sense, but it feels that way. It does, but especially in the in the world of EB five, uh, it's more has happened in the last seven months in EB five than has happened in the last seven years, literally, and uh, it just seems as though it's just nonstop. It does feel that way at times. Notwithstanding whatever happened in the last seven months, Mark, I don't want to rehash it because I know from a lot of people who are talking to us and writing to us that they just want to know what to expect for 2022. What's going to happen this year? (laughs) It makes sense. So to better serve our listeners, let's now look forward. What can we expect out of 2022? Every year is a new uncertainty. And that's why we always like to bring expert voices on the show, which is why on today's episode, we are excited to bring back not just a past guest, Not just the past president of American Immigration Lawyers Association, but a current active EB-5 attorney, one that is in the trenches of EB-5 and sees the moving and shifting lines of these uh, trenches and borders. Ron Glasgow, (laughs) welcome to the show. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. I certainly agree we are in uncertain times. You know, everybody has one question on their mind. Are we going to see reauthorization of the RC program, either February, March, sometime in the first six months, or any time in 2022? Well, Mona, I I would start by saying that I don't think there's a human being alive who knows for sure what the answer to that is. (laughs) And that means anybody (laughs) within the government, or me, or you, or anyone else. Um, I do have my opinions. Educated guess, educated opinions. (laughs) My my educated guess is that the Regional Center program will be reauthorized sometime during the first half of 2022. Yeah. And I, I, there's two parts to that, right? The first part is it, it, it definitely is not going to be a standalone bill. They're not going to vote on EB-5 separately. It'll have to be attached to something, almost certainly to the continuing resolution. So the first question is, well, when will the continuing resolution be voted on? And right now, we're hoping it'll be February 18. But if you follow the U.S. government, you know that's very unpredictable. And they could extend that to April. They could extend that to June. There's no saying for sure when that's going to happen. So that's the first part of the question. Then the second part of the question, whenever it is, is it February or April, whenever it is, will it include EB-5? If I were a betting man, I would bet in favor of it. I think there's probably more than a 50% chance that it will. I'm not prepared to say there's a 90% chance that it will. But I think the chances are better that it will include EB-5. Yeah, but Ron, I mean, this program brings in 5 to $7 billion a year. I don't see Congress skipping on it. Boy, I sure hope you're right. And I don't think anybody, there's, there's nobody I know in Congress who is saying, boy, I want this program to die. Yeah. Uh, but you've got to understand EB-5 is an immigration program. People in Congress want to do everything they possibly can to never have to touch or vote on an immigration issue. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, for some, this might be their favorite immigration program, but it's still immigration. Right. So that's really a problem. I think it's going to boil down. It's, it's not a question of, you know, do it, does a majority of the people in the House or the Senate f- favor the program? Yeah, they do. But it's it's really three people that matter at this point. It's it's you know, Majority Leader Schumer, who's really the most important person, because he can make things happen. He can decide what is going to be voted on and what isn't, and what's going to be in the continuing resolution and what isn't. The second 
And third, most important people are Senators Grassley and Leahy, who've taken the lead on this, and almost all of their colleagues in the Senate defer to them. The Republicans yeah. defer to Grassley, the Democrats defer to uh, uh, to Leahy. Part of the dynamic is Leahy is leaving the Senate at the end of this year. I thought uh, Grassley was leaving the Senate. I thought Leahy uh, was I still there. So. Uh, Mona, I don't think so. I think Grassley is, and you may be right, I just hadn't heard that, but I thought Grassley was staying and and Leahy is leaving. So I don't know how that plays, you know, factors into the equation. Hmm. But I think Leahy would like to get a bill done. And, you know, if Schumer goes to Leahy, then, you know, Leahy might push him to do something. But there is inertia on this right now. There's 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 nobody that I know of, whether it's Leahy or Grassley or Schumer, who has this as a priority right now. Yeah. Well, we have heard that Schumer had a meeting or is having a meeting this week with the uh, real estate roundtable in New York City, who really do have a lot of sway with him. But at the same time, we've been hearing a lot about the Rand Paul and Lindsey Graham bill, um, the one which they have brought up, which is at um, the minimum amount would be at 750. My own educated guess on this is that there's two main bills. Uh, one is uh, the what I call the industry consensus bill uh, that uh, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce played a major role in. Uh, and the other is the Grassley-Leahy bill. Well, Ron, between those two, if you were to guess, if you were to make a prediction, what do you think will happen? There's three or four possibilities. One is it could be a straight reauthorization, just you know, one line, the program's reauthorized. I don't think that'll happen. Yeah. Second is that they'll pass the industry consensus bill. I don't think that'll happen, although it's possible. Uh, the third is that uh, there'll be some other bills, such as uh, the, the Graham bill that you mentioned. I don't think that'll happen. I think the most likely thing is that some version, and there's been many versions of it, but some version of Grassley Leahy will be what gets tacked on to the continuing resolution. I think you may be right. Of course, a lot of people are asking us. Um, I, I see there's a confusion all around as to what is going to happen with the existing cases. Should there be a delay? Uh, will we, we get th- these cases grandfathered in under FIFPA or will they be dealt with separately? Again, you're right. Nobody knows. But what I have heard for sure is that there is no one in Congress who does not appreciate that the previous investors need to be grandfathered. There's not a question of leaving them out in the cold, so to speak. Well, yeah, I I agree that if you poll the senators and the representatives, they would say that. But that's far different from an actual bill that gets drafted to do that and that has to get voted on, and that that either Pelosi or Schumer has to put on the calendar to get voted on, and that has the word immigration in. It's not just a question of do people think it's a good idea. You know, strategically, all the parties have to look at the fact that once Congress deals with EB-5 once, they sure aren't going to be dealing with it a second time. Hmm. So if there's a pure grandfathering bill, And then they say, all right, well, you know, let's do the grandfathering now and then we'll deal with the reauthorization and all the other grassley Leahy stuff. I don't think that's going to happen. Mm. What do you think would happen then? I think the best bet is getting the reauthorization done and ideally getting a grandfathering provision in there. Because even if, if the program's reauthorized, in order to restore faith in the program, it's important to have a grandfathering provision because it's you know, at most, you're going to have something like a five-year extension if they reauthorize. And will people invest if they know that they're going to deal with this five years from now? Oh, no. We're going to have a whole lot of lawsuits as well, I, I'm sure, if we have a long delay. I agree. So I, I believe grandfathering is critical. I would prefer to have it in a reauthorization bill, a separate standalone grandfathering bill without reauthorization. I think probably doesn't help the chances of getting a separate bill on reauthorization. You know, Ron, just was it just this week we heard that USCIS pulled out of uh, voluntarily pulled out of the burying case appeal. They pulled their appeal rather. Uh, and do you think that if we get a clean or three authorization for say six months just to clear some of the cases, that may prompt new USCIS regulations? Well, yeah. I mean, that the withdrawal of the appeal in the burying case, Mona, is really important because. Any increase in investment amount, we were always concerned if the Court of Appeals overturned the Bering case, 
then you know people who were investing today in direct projects at 500,000 could lose out because of a court of appeals decision. Well, that's gone now. And any legislation or regulation that increases the investment amount uh, should only be prospective, which means that anybody who has invested since uh, November of 2019 at, uh, at a 500,000 level, if they're in a TEA, should be fine. So that's really, really significant. Yes, if there's a clean reauthorization, you know, a one-liner saying the program's reauthorized and nothing else, or if there's a full bill that doesn't mention an investment amount, then I do think at some point, USCIS will issue a regulation to increase the investment amount, but then there would be a window of opportunity yeah. for people to file regional center applications at 500000 before USCIS does that. Well, that would indicate that we would have uh, the amount at 500000 for some time, because of course, there's this panic filing right now going on that, um, you know, will will the amounts remain at 500,000? And panic filing not in regional center cases, but in direct pool cases, which is prompting all kinds of, of nonsense. I mean, we have some very, very good direct pool cases, but we're also seeing the Wild West coming back. Yeah. So really, it, it, in some ways, it's obviously the law is different on the directs. You know, it's got to, obviously it's got to have 10 direct jobs and yeah. and it's got to be, a you know, an investment where you own some percentage of the business. And, you know, there are some different rules, but the bottom line is the same, whether it's a regional center project or it's a direct DB5 pooled project. It's our role, as you know, Mona, to review uh, the project documents to make sure that it qualifies under the direct program. If it does, then it's fine. You know, one of the differences with a direct, assuming you have a perfectly qualifying pool direct, is that the 829 process uh, becomes uh, somewhat more complex because you have to prove uh, prove out the direct jobs at the time of the of the 829 filing, which is usually more work than on a regional center. But, you know, in, in some ways, a direct project is not all that different than a regional center project because either the project documents are or are not in compliance with what's required for EB-5. Well, do you think then, Ron, we do have some time while it's still at 500000 Because the, that is quite affordable for a lot of people. Well, I think, yeah. I mean, right now, especially since the Bering appeal was withdrawn, Mm -hmm. Now, I think people can, with confidence, uh, make 500,000 TEA direct DB5 uh, filings. And as long as the investment amount is not increased by the time they file, they should be okay at the 500,000 level, even if after that, a regulation or legislation increases the amount. Yeah, that was always the fear prior to this, that there may be some retroactivity, which, as you say, has gone now. But saying that, do we still urge our clients to file as soon as possible? Because we don't know how long it'll be at 500,000. Yeah, if I have a client uh, who wants to do EB-5 and wants to do it at 500,000 and understands what's involved with a direct EB-5, by all means, I would encourage them to do it now because we don't know if and when the amount's going to go up. I, I would say the if is, yes, it will go up. The yeah. when is, I don't have a clue. Yeah, no, I, I, th I think that's right. And I think the, the when will be sometime this year. I can't see it going beyond this year. I, I'd be very surprised if it goes beyond this year. I agree with you, Mona. Mm, but we do have elections coming up also in midterms. So I don't know if that will play into the timing. I don't see that it does. I don't, you know, I can't see this being an issue affected by the election. Um, even if the House turns Republican, you know, a lot of immigration issues are Democrat and Republican issues. This doesn't really break down that way. And mm -hmm. I don't, in my mind, I don't see the election and the possible shift in the House changing any of this. So if I if we have a client tomorrow who says, look, I want to move forward with our direct petitions, but even if we are, are we seeing any movement in USCIS? Are we still looking at filing mandamus petitions? You know, you 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 guys are the experts here on this yeah. area. <laughs> yeah, are we seeing movement? Not much. And and this know. is 
And in a way, Mona, that makes the mandamus cases even stronger because the Immigration Service always talked uh, in, in defending mandamus cases how overwhelmed they were with all these cases. Well, now they're not overwhelmed. You know, they're not getting very many filings at all. They had hundreds of EB-5 adjudicators uh, who apparently are either doing nothing or were reassigned to do something else as opposed to working on all the direct EB-5s and working on all the 829s. Right. The 829s still have ridiculous backgrounds. The direct 526s have, have you know, really crazy you know, backlogs and processing. And they have not used the availability of the EB-5 examiners to clear those backlogs. And I think that really helps a mandamus case on a delayed, either a delayed 829 or a delayed uh, direct 526. Any chance of filing anything relating to 829 and the courts pushing it back, saying that the regional center programs are not currently available? No, I, I don't. I haven't seen that, and I don't expect we'll see that. Uh, I think everyone agrees that the reauthorization of the regional center program is not relevant to the ability of uh, people who are conditional residents to get their conditions removed. But Ron, just to make sure, uh, anyone who wants to file a mandamus case right now, whilst the regional center program is currently in the state of flux, not the direct program, I must state, if they filed a mandamus petition, there is a strong chance that the courts, not even a strong chance, I would say, I would say the courts could not come back with a decision, right? Well, okay. I would say that uh, the uh, traditional wisdom would be that the courts could not. I happen to think that there is a possible basis for federal court litigation uh, that would challenge the fact that USCIS is not adjudicating these petitions, uh, despite the fact that the program is not reauthorized. Uh, I don't want to go into a lot of detail on, on some of the legal theories on that, but it is something we've been looking at. Interesting, because I just heard recently about a colleague of ours' um, petition was was thrown out of court on the basis that there's no regional center program. And that was one person we heard. I think it was a court out on the West Coast. Yeah. I'm, uh, again, traditional wisdom is that. And I think it would be something more than just a straight mandamus case, you know, that would uh, would involve uh, probably a number of interesting and creative legal theories. Uh, you know, in order to get a court to, you know, to make a ruling on this, there's different issues here. You know, one issue is, well, even if they can't issue EB-5 green cards or EB-5 immigrant visas, what says that they can't adjudicate an EB-5 petition is one issue. Another issue is if something is approvable when filed under matter of Izumi, Uh, Does that give you some basis for going forward? Another issue is, you know, the EB-5 immigrant visas still exist statutorily. It's just the the regional center program, which was a set aside of a certain number of the visas, does not exist. Does that provide for anything? So, again, I don't want to go into more detail at this point. It is smart. Smart ideas. Yeah, uh I'm following you. I think these are all things that we are going to see in 2022, if we, at least if, if we carry on the way we started <laughs> at, at the moment. But another thing, uh, another thing I want to ask you, 2022, I know my colleague, colleague Rebecca is pulling her hair out at all the problems and issues mm-hmm. going on at the consulate. Some have got COVID related and some are just, you know, just, just straight stupidity. Are you doing warms out there at the consulate? Yeah. I haven't seen any formal policy of the State Department to not process directs, but it sure seems like they're not processing directs. Uh, And there's obviously no statutory basis uh, for them not to process. It has nothing to do with the uh, reauthorization of the regional center program. You know, we've certainly done a number of successful mandamus cases on consuls failing to act. There's a, a difference between trying to get a consular denial overturned, which gets involved in what's called consular non-reviewability and can be difficult to overcome. But if the consul simply refuses to process or refuses to interview, 
or refuses to make a decision, that is perfectly appropriate for a writ of mandamus. Yeah, I totally agree. I think that uh, <laughs> I can see this this year being no different from last in that respect. Ron, do you see the return of China or other Asian markets happening this year? No, that's that's a hard one to. I mean, it for if you're a direct, if if you're a Chinese person, and you can get your direct EB five petition adjudicated within a reasonable time. And and the regional center program hasn't been reauthorized. There are you're current as of today. You are current. Yeah. But as far as you know, something happening where the regional center program gets reauthorized. Uh, once that happens, then all of the Chinese applicants uh, go back into the line that they were in originally. And I don't see anything that's likely to happen that's going to seriously reduce the number of years of uh, waiting time. The only only difference I would say suggest is if you did have a expedited case and you did manage to get approved in the next few months. Otherwise, we, I don't see it happening. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, but I do see an interest in other Asian markets. If not China, we still do see a lot from of interest from Vietnam and Korea. Yes, I, I we see a lot of interest from Vietnam, from India. Yeah. Uh, from South Africa, yeah. from you know various countries around the world. In Asia, I would say the greatest interest that we see is probably from Vietnam. Yeah, well, South Asian markets, I think all, all of the countries are still very popular, India being the most popular, because we don't seem to be going anywhere on the EB2 and EB3 country uh, caps uh, sections either. Yeah, I, I fully expect that if there's a window of opportunity on the regional centers, where the program's reauthorized and the investment amount is still at 500,000, uh, I am expecting that uh, most of the calls we're going to receive are going to be from folks from India. You know, Ron, as we wait for the regional center program to be reauthorized and for them to figure out all of the issues relating to that, you know, I'd like to be able to say to our clients who are out there, maybe some who have children who are going to age out, not to wait, because that's a question I'm sure you guys are getting asked a lot as well. Should we wait for the regional center program to be reauthorized or should we do something else? We are talking to our clients about, you know, what is possible, what is definitely possible versus what we don't know about in the future. It is definitely possible to do a direct DB5 now. There are direct DB5 pooled projects that do appear to be approvable. It doesn't have to be a pooled project. It can be in your own business. Uh, so we are fine with people doing direct EB5s right now, as opposed to waiting for the possibility of the, of the program, of the regional center program being reauthorized. Right. And also understanding that if they do a direct EB-5 now, they can definitely do it in a TEA at the 500,000 level. We do not know if they will be able to do it at the 500,000 level when the regional center program is reauthorized. It's very possible that they will not. So it's not just saying regional center versus direct. It may be saying you know 500,000 versus 800,000 or versus a million or versus a million eight. And so for a lot of people, it makes sense to proceed with a direct EB-5 now. I couldn't agree more with you, Ron. But before we end, what other words of wisdom do you have for this episode for, for, for 2022? Well, I can tell you that what we're discussing with our clients generally is uh, the possibility of direct EB-5, uh, which uh, is still a long-term solution because given the processing times, this is not something that's going to get you any status in the next year uh, and maybe in the next two years. So we discuss direct EB-5 as a long-term strategy. And for some, we talk about uh, the E-2 treaty investor visa as the immediate or short-term strategy. And it's straightforward if they are from a country that has an investment treaty with the U.S., if they're from a country that doesn't have an investment treaty with the U.S., such as, for example, China and India and Russia, and South Africa, and Brazil, and Saudi Arabia, and many others, then we talk to them about first getting citizenship by investment in either Turkey or Grenada, which do have citizenship by investment programs and do have investment treaties with the U.S., 
and then we can immediately proceed with applying for a five-year E2 visa. For some of our clients, that is perfectly fine, and they don't even have to do EB-5 later. And for others, it fills in the gap until EB-5 is available. Well, that's saying, Ron, that as long as you can get to the consulates, because otherwise you're doing your mandamus magic at the consulates as well. <laughs> Certainly, you, you couldn't be more correct, Mona. Everything <laughs> in the pandemic, anytime you're talking about timing and pandemic in the same sentence, you know that it's everything is uncertain. So yeah. we, we, we do have issues of delays at consulates on E2s that we have to deal with. Yeah, it certainly depends if you can get into the consulates or not with everything going on. <laughs> Ron Glasgow, thank you so much for joining us virtually here on this episode of EB5 Investment Voice. My pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for being with us today on EB5 Investment Voice. The topics presented in this podcast is informational in nature and is not to be taken as specific legal advice. If you have questions on the topics presented in this episode or other investment immigration needs, please contact Mona Shaw and Associates. Mona and her attorney staff can be reached at mshawlaw.com. That's M-S-H-A-H law.com. Make sure you don't miss our next episode focusing on a different aspect of the EB-5 program by subscribing to the podcast. While you're at it, leave us a rating on iTunes. If you really found this episode valuable, share it with someone else that could benefit from this information. Until then, I'll see you on the next episode of EB-5 Investment Voice.